Okay, hi, everyone. Um, welcome to another tutorial um, in our data skills workshop um, series at the Data Science Lab. Um, I'm just going to admit a few more people into the session today. Um, so um, as um, some of you already know me, um, in case you are um, not a lawyer and uh, if you haven't met me yet, uh, my name is Sui and I'm from the Data Science Lab at the Hurdy School. And uh, here at the Hurdy School, uh, we try to organize these um, workshops and tutorials as part of our outreach effort um, for the general public to inform you of um, the latest development in the field of uh, data science and AI uh, and how these new tools and technologies can perhaps help you potentially to solve some of your daily problems um, as well as your work and your research. And so um, for today, um, we will touch on the topic of AI generative art, um, which um, personally, I think it's a very fascinating topic. Um, and also it's a really um, great time right now to get into this topic. Um, with the speed of development of these new technologies. And um, this year alone, we have seen just remarkable progress in um, the space. And I really hope that um, through uh, today's sessions, you will be also be able to get excited about the future of these technologies and about the future of art and what's to come. Uh, we have a lot of ground to cover. Um, and so hopefully we'll be able to uh, manage and uh, finish everything um, uh, within the hour. Um, so first uh, we will, in, in the session today, first we will start off um, with um, the evolutions of AI art and how it all began. Uh, and then we will explore um, the mechanics behind AI technologies and um, perhaps behind some of the most popular AI generation art techniques today. And then afterwards, uh, we will dive into the prompt engineering. Um, this is the fun part of the tutorial when you can also uh, create with me and also see what kind of art that we can come up with. Um, and finally, we will discuss um, some of the recent controversies um, with AI art communities and what the future of this technology might hold. Um, and who knows, by the end of the sessions, um, some of you might want to change career perhaps um, to become AI artists and prompt engineers, um, or perhaps you want to build tools and platforms to help um, others um, to access this new and wonderful technology. And uh, so with that, uh, we will translate, uh, we will transition into our first session here. Um, first, it's um, we will focus on a brief history of AI generative art. Um, and by the way, um, all the images, almost all the images that we will see in this presentation here today um, are generated by an AI. And um, whenever this is the case, um, there will be a prompt or text that accompany um, the image, as you can see here on the left. Uh, and um, so uh, later on, after the sessions, you can use this prompt basically to um, generate um, a very similar image to this, for example, in the AI art engine of your choice. And we will go over this um, in a little bit in their uh, practice session. Um, so first, uh, we need to make sure that um, we're all um, on the same page in terms of definitions. So AI art, um, to me at least, um, it means that arts that are created by or with the assistance, with the assistance of artificial intelligence technologies. Um, a very simple definitions, um, and then what is um, that AI technologies that we're talking about here? We will dive in, into that a little bit deeper in the second part of the sessions. Um, so how did it actually start? Um, we have to go all the way back to the 19th centuries um, when the idea and the concept of the first computer was uh, conceived. So in um, the 1840s, um, Ada Lovelace, um, she was a British mathemat mathematician, and she combined her creativity um, and her analytical ability um, to come up with this driving principles behind the analytical engines, which was considered um, nowadays um, as the first concept for a computer program that was ever uh, that was never physically built. And so she speculated that this engine could follow a series of simple instructions um, and to perform complex um, calculations as well as tasks. And eventually she speculated that um, this machine could think for itself and it can also compose music and create art. And so her story is an absolutely fascinating one. Um, her father is uh, Lord Byron, um, the famous uh, British poet. Her mother is Annabella, uh, who is um, also a poet, poet and she was um, just so horrified by Byron's um, extreme personality and artistic um, tendencies um, that uh, she made sure that her daughter would study science and become a mathematician. And so um, at the very start, we already see this um, conflict between art and science, which I personally think is um, very um, poetic um, when we talk about um, the battle that is being waged today by traditional artists and AI artists um, when we talk about the controversies of AI art uh, later on. 
And uh, after Ada Lovelace, uh, more than a century later in the 1950s, we have Alan Turing, who is also an English mathematician um, and a computer scientist. Um, and he developed the famous Turing test that you most of you probably know about as well. Um, and um, it's also known as the um, imitation game. Um, it's the test that questions a computer's ability to show intelligent behavior like a human. And uh, Turing's methods um, has nowadays become the pillars in the field of artificial intelligence to try to test out how AI developed today, um, how comparable they are to humans' um, uh, ability to speak and to create um, different things. And so there's um, a great movie with um, Benedict Cumberbatch um, that revolves around Turing's um, life and also contributions to World War II, uh, World War II and code breaking. Um, unfortunately, that movie didn't um, touch a lot on uh, this ideas about machine intelligence, but um, it's, it's a great topic. I think um, you will find, I think, a lot of interesting things about Turing's life, as well as uh, ideas about um, you know, intelligence in, in machines and AI um, that we can explore. Um, and also in the 1950s um, and also early 60s, um, artists started to engage with this new technologies and this new ideas and experimentations uh, with computer graphics. And then in the early days, um, we have um, artists like um, Manfred Moore, as well as uh, Vera Mondo. Uh, and they basically use um, algorithms to create patterns in computer arts. And they also explore these um, different anesthetics possibilities and uh, that are created by computer graphics and computer processes. Um, and as you can see here in the pictures, um, so here are some of the arts that were created by them. So they mainly try to use algorithms to create some kind of um, artifacts uh, in the machines. Uh, and um, as you can see, there uh, seems to be some rules that are um, that these algorithms follow, and they will be cre to create um, some very visually interesting images. Um, and even though some of the technologies that we have nowadays for AI um, and um, some of the ideas and methods that are being employed right now in current AI systems um, have already been around in these early days, and they have already been there, and mathematicians and computer scientists have already theorized about them, but only now, um, with the advances in performance in computing and the capability for computers to process a vast amount of data, that um, together with the new algorithms that are being developed today, so that are we are able to um, build on these old ideas, and we can have um, the breakthroughs that we have nowadays in um, AI generated art. And so um, the next um, step in the progress of AI generative art is um, a generative um, adversarial network, which was invented by Ian Goodfellow. Um, and uh, he introduced basically this idea um, about a generative and dis uh, discriminator um, model that can kind of fight against each other in order to create like really good images. And so um, this new model, basically they use a vast quantity of existing images and it can create um, completely new uh, and model um, novel images that have never been seen before. And so um, it's um, it's a really fascinating um, uh, method, um, and a lot of people have talked about this. And for example, the deep fake technologies that are being used by a lot of um, criminals nowadays, for example, or people that want to create um, fake images, it's basically based on uh, the GAN methods. Um, and one of the first applications of um, GAN in AI generative art is um, basically Deep Dream Engine. Um, it's, um, I think, part of a Google project. And it's created by Alexander um, Morvinchev, and uh, it basically looks like this. Um, um, like for me, like not actually, it's not to my taste, but um, it's quite trippy to see, and you can like, kind of see how it uses um, different um, artists and styles that have been there before to create, some, to create something basically completely new. And um, so that's basically what we have seen so far in terms of the history and the developments of um, AI art and AI generative um, technologies. Um, and the next part, uh, we will um, explore the mechanics um, of the different technologies and, uh, and techniques um, um, that are being uh, present on the market nowadays. And understanding these, how these systems works um, and how they are able to create images is actually quite useful in learning how to craft the best possible images generated by these engines. And so um, please bear with me for the next um, seven or 10 minutes. It's gonna be quite dense, I think, um, in the slides coming ahead. Um, so um, first we need to make an, uh, an a distinguish um, a factor between um, two types of AI generated art. So first we have the rule-based generative art, which are basically works that are created by artists and by computer scientists who study the different patterns of things and then they try to code up these different precise rules 
um, with maybe some degree of randomness um, into um, a model that can generate these arts. Uh, and so there are many popular libraries and tools that have already been there um, to create these, um, uh, such as um, P5.js or processing on Canva 2D. Um, and you can see in some of the examples here uh, by artists um, that are working in rule-based and generative art here, that um, there seems to be a certain rules and there's certain patterns that are emerging from these things. And um, I can show one example um, of um, this. Um, I think, for example, uh, here is um, an art that is uh, created by rule-based um, um, generative model. So as you can see, it looks quite beautiful in terms of um, the visual and the colors. And the way that they create this is that um, the artist basically code up some uh, a very precise rules on how he wants these different lines and these different colors to um, emerge. And so as you can see here, it's, um, it's very rigid in terms of what um, these kind of art can create. And so there's a lot of limitations that comes with um, um, arts that are created by rule-based systems. And then uh, we have the, the next kind of generative art, which is an AI-based uh, system. An AI-based art system is a little bit different. So for a rule-based system, usually um, the artist just write up an algorithm and then the algorithm give you an output. But for uh, AI-based um, uh, art, uh, it needs also um, a vast quantity of input um, that can help you help it to learn the patterns from the data. So for rule-based um, generative art, um, the artists are the ones that comes up with the patterns. And for AI-based art, the algorithms is the one that comes up with the pattern itself. And um, this is the system that we employ for AI arts that are um, in the most popular models on market nowadays. And um, in this system, basically there's no handholding for the AI on how it can create these patterns. Um, uh, instead, you give it basically enough principles so that it can solve certain problems. Um, and you don't have to know exactly how it arrive, arrives at the solutions. And um, so yes, this is uh, the process basically. Um, so you basically put it a lot of data and then this data is then transformed in a way that the algorithms or the computers can understand and mainly it's um, numbers and it's matrix and, um, and vectors um, in the machines. And then the algorithms, it sounds like a fancy thing, but it's actually basically just a set of simple um, instructions that can solve problems or learn patterns in the data. And you can think of algorithm as basically um, the AI's um, IKEA um, instructions on how to assemble chairs or a table basically. And um, through the algorithms, it process these data and these transformations and it approximate and it creates some kind of output um, in, um, that we would actually want to see. Uh, and so um, we first come to generative adversarial network, which I mentioned earlier um, in their histories of AI art. Uh, and this is basically the way that this uh, model works um, on, um, and how it can basically uh, generate new images. And this is a method that tries to automatically learn and discover patterns in the data inputs. And, it, and then it tries to generate possible outputs that are completely new. Um, and it does so by employing two main components that I mentioned earlier. First is the generator model and the discriminator model. So similar to the um, image that we saw here earlier, right? So first we need a huge amount of data. And then this data set basically create, um, from this um, you sample out um, uh, some images. So for example, you can, an example is, for example, like a list of um, images uh, in, uh, in human faces, for example, or maybe images of cars or images of cats. And so that is a huge data set of um, images of cats on, in this case, um, a huge data set of um, images of polar bears. And then what happens um, inside the algorithms is that uh, first, um, the algorithm is fed with random noise, which is basically just um, yeah, an image like this, for example, which is like just very noisy um, and uh, um, you can't really make out anything here. And the generator model, um, it's basically tries to uh, process this random noise and add in some information to transfer it into some kind of image. Um, and it doesn't have to, and in the first step, this image doesn't have to completely um, be similar to uh, the model image that we try to mimic. Um, and what happens is that this sample image uh, that is from the real world data sets and the image that is generated by the uh, generated model, it's fed into a discriminator. And basically it's someone, uh, it's um, um, the, machine, uh, the model that tries to see whether or not the image that comes from the real data set uh, and the image that is generated by the um, generator, like how close they are, like uh, uh, is this image that is generated by the, the generator, is it fake or not? 
And for example, here in the first step, you can see it's obviously fake um, and the discriminator can discover that and it basically make a decision that this is fake. And then this information, it's um, used to calculate the loss um, functions of um, this um, model. It's basically a feedback for the models. Um, and so this is basically feedback to the generators that, oh, okay, so this discriminator say that this image is fake. And we have some information from the sample upward as well. And so the generator, what they would do is, what it will do is basically, it will try to mimic and replicate some of the attributes of this image um, in the real world data sets. And then this happens uh, for hundreds and thousands of um, rounds and iterations until one point where it can actually assimilate some of the attributes of the real world image. And then it, and then at that point, the discriminator will not be able to um, discover or not whether or not this is fake or this is real. And this is the point where it starts to be able to create something that is completely new, but still have some very similar attributes to um, the, uh, the sample uh, image uh, in the real world. And so um, this is basically the way that generated model works. Uh, and um, there's a lot of limitation to this um, because um, the way the gener generated model works, it has to depend a lot on um, this real image data sets because a lot of the things that it tries to replicate, it tried to replicate from this data set. And so there's some limitations in terms of what kind of images that it can actually um, generate. And there's also a lot of different um, uh, issues in, in model collapsing, for example. And so, um, but at the same time, it was a very good um, um, model. And I think it's a very good uh, first uh, try in terms of generative art um, to create something completely new from a massive amount of data. And um, so the applications, as I mentioned earlier, is um, for example, deepfake um, or uh, these um, models that can basically create human faces um, or cars and cats um, that are um, just completely new. And so um, one of the examples is, um, I think about two years ago, I created this um, uh, Herdy Christmas card and it's basically an AI painter that is um, using um, Stigan model. Um, and like the principle is very same, right? So you give it, uh, for example, um, I gave it a lot of um, data uh, that is basically a lot of um, arts um, from the Renaissance area, uh, era. And then I um, basically give the model that time to train and to become familiar with the um, uh, art from the Renaissance era, and then it can basically create like a lot of different images um, from that um, era based on the massive amount of data that I feed into it. And so, um, as you can see here, um, yeah, I will basically give this um, notebook at the end of the session as well in case you want to try it out. Um, so yeah, this is basically one example that um, the model can create. Um, so yeah, there's still a lot of artifacts. For example, here in the faces that you can see that it's not perfect but it can somewhat create something that is very similar to like a Renaissance painting um, and uh, a human face, for example. And um, you can also create videos uh, with this. Um, so yeah, for example, this is a uh, latent uh, space explorations. This is basically what the models is doing when it's trying to generate this image, right? So it's basically trying out different patterns and different images, and then it's trying to form um, and, um, uh, yeah, converge uh, in, in a particular image. Um, and then, yeah, finally, maybe somewhere here, we will see an image that is um, uh, very tasteful and something that we would like to see in our model. Um, and yeah, you can uh, create videos and yeah, I had a few friends who actually create music videos from this uh, model before. So that is one example um, from um, generative model. Um, the next model that we want to touch on is a diffusion model, and this is um, also a very, I think, a very fascinating model um, in the sense that this model, the objective of this model is something that is quite different. So the objective of this um, GAN model is to generate new images uh, as close as possible to the real imagery. And um, for um, diffusion model, um, the objective is something quite different. So diffusion model, what, how, what you do is that you give the model an image. And then the, um, the model gradually through different time step, it gives a lot of different noises to the image. So gradually the, the image um, comes from something that is very clear, something that is very yeah, beautiful. Uh, to me, at least a pox, uh, with glasses, it's quite beautiful and fun. Uh, and then gradually it becomes more and more noisy until it becomes basically just like random noise. And the next step in um, the reverse diffusion uh, step is basically it tries to learn the way to denoise, uh, which is how does it create an image basically from these noisy things, and then gradually how do you come back to 
an image that is um, yeah, beautiful and nice and, and funky like this. And so um, yeah, that's the whole idea behind diffusion model. It uh, basically learns. Um, you basically give it a lot of data, and all these data are gradually no um, becoming more noisy. And then you try to basically predict what is the next step in order to gradually bring it back to the original image. And as always, you can never from just a random image, bring back something that is completely the same as the original image, right? So there's always gonna be some random variations um, because um, these noises, like it's not ex an exact science. And so gradually when you add in these things, you will have a lot of different artifacts, for example, like it would not um, be like a glass, for example, it might be something completely different. It might be a mustache. And so, um, but doing so uh, by doing this, the models can basically learn how to bring a noisy image like this to something that actually um, resembles something that we are familiar with. And that is the diffusion model. And um, the next one is uh, transformer models. Um, and um, this is also quite fascinating because um, uh, for transformer, um, there's a lot of art, um, literatures and a lot of videos and a lot of um, tutorials about this already. But for transformer, I want to talk specifically about the clip model, which is a model created by OpenAI um, foundations. And this model, the way that it uh, learns is that it learns from two things at the same time. So the data that you give it, first is you give it um, an image. The second thing that you give it is uh, a caption. And what the model learns is um, the model learns to try to associate um, the text that is in the captions with the elements inside the image. And so as you can see here, the, this clip model, it basically takes in an image. It encodes the image um, into uh, uh, representations of the image um, and inside a machine. And those are basically just uh, vectors of number. Um, and same thing with um, the text. It tries to encode the text into a representation of the text inside the machine, also numbers. And then it tries to calculate and predict whether or not this caption and this photos are similar, like whether or not this caption actually described this photo. And so, for example, as you can see here, um, this predictions of the, the model is that it's not similar, but in actuality, in uh, the ground truth is that um, this caption actually describes exactly what happens in this, um, this image. And so um, this information is basically feedback into this, um, this model. And so the now model knows, ah, okay, so these, um, these words and these uh, texts here actually describe these different things that are in this model. And so by doing so, this model learns the connection between text and images and whether the embeddings are similar or not. And so as you can see here, we, we have these three different models, right? So we have the transformer models, the clip model that can learn the connection between text and images. Then you have the models that can learn to denoise and basically creating an image out of noisy things. And we have a model that basically also do the same things, but what it does is that it basically brings the images that for example, that image might be here in this step where it's still quite noisy. And it tries to bring, bring that images as possible, as close as possible to the original image. And so these three models are basically the foundationals and the steps that I use um, in the latest models that are on the market right now, which is the latent diffusion model. And so um, for this model, this is the last one. So uh, please bear with me and we will uh, break through this and, and go to the fun part of the sessions. So for this model, um, we start with a prom, right? So we start with a text prom um, similar to this um, uh, model here. Uh, so illustrations of a majestic lion in close-up Ghibli style. Uh, and what it does inside the model is that this prompt is uh, then processed by a, cl a clip text um, model. And as we've seen earlier here, um, this model is basically knows how to connect um, different text and words with certain images, right? And so this model basically by processing this, um, this text, it creates these uh, token embeddings. And this token embeddings basically has information on both the words and information on how close they are with certain images. And so basically this um, token embedding information is that has the connections of both the text and the image. And in the next step of the model, uh, the model is fed uh, with a random image um, info tensor. And this is basically just random noise, right? So um, you can imagine that uh, this is basically just a random noise and it's the representation of that random noise inside the model. And it's basically just uh, uh, vectors of numbers. And by combining um, the text information here and the random noise here, the text information here can guide the random noise to create certain images 
Um, so as we mentioned earlier, so this basically has connections to different images. Uh, and this basically can help to denoise the image. And so the way that it happens inside the model is that this text that we have here, it guides this noisy things into certain things, right? So it guides this noisy part um, to become certain images. And so by training all these, um, um, these two steps over and over again, the model is able to basically achieve something that is quite similar to what it's, yeah. um, the text is trying to, um, to describe here. And then um, after that, we basically have a process image um, that, that is quite close to what we want to create. And then it's decoded by an image decoder. Um, and that image decoder basically turns that into something like this. And so this is a real, um, uh, uh, real yeah, so. symmetry. Uh, and um, this is something that um, was actually created um, by a stable diffusion model that is um, uh, using a Ghibli Lee style uh, to generate image, for example. So this is, you will not see this image in any of the Ghibli Lee mo movie that are available right now. And so this is something that is completely new. And so the goal of this model is basically to create novel images from text prompts. And by combining all these three different models that we've talked about before. Um, and so that's basically how we are able to create um, models that are on the market right now that are able to generate um, images that are quite beautiful, just based on the text prompt that we have. And um, please note that this is a very simplified um, and high level version of what actually takes place inside these models. Uh, if you are interested in learning more about the actual math um, and the complex models behind it, um, links will be in the reference uh, sessions um, with actual papers and explanations um, about how this actually um, happens inside the model. And um, the majority um, of the AI generated engines that we are using today um, actually are employing some kind of uh, models like this, basically um, a latent deficient models. Um, and so the concept of this model here is able, we'll be able to apply to a lot of different things um, together. Uh, okay, so I hope everyone is still with me. Uh, we're through to the toughest part of um, the sessions and now comes to the fun part, which is um, the prompt engineering. How do we actually create um, beautiful images from um, these uh, models and from um, things that we want to, to create? So there's a common say in uh, the art world that um, it's the artists and not the tools that are the important thing. Uh, and Or if you're a fan of um, the Top Gun movies with um, Tom Cruise, um, it's not the plane, it's the pilot, right? So um, this is still very much um, very true with AI generated art. How good your generative art is depends a lot on your creativity and the, your ability to express your ideas in as much detail as possible. And um, so we're going through three different um, AI generative services here that are very popular on the market right now. Uh, DALI, uh, Stable Diffusions, and Midjourney. Um, so DALI, um, which is the, the, uh, the leader of the pack, is uh, basically the first one that came out. I think it was in the beginning of 2021. Um, during the pandemic, I think um, it, it was, I think, in January, if I remember correctly. And it was um, a very close beta in the beginning um, with um, a very long wait list for people to get into. And so um, I think it's mainly just computer scientists um, and researchers that are able to get access to it in the beginning. And so in the initial release, um, it, uh, in terms of um, public um, engagement, there was not a lot there. Uh, and so um, all, the, um, all the different explosion of AI art actually came out this year when Stable Diffusions um, um, came out in, into the public. I think it came out in August this year. And they basically were an open source um, effort to basically create these different models that are very similar to DALI, which is a, mo a model that can create art from just text descriptions. And so it opened basically a floodgate uh, of AI generated art that is uh, open to the general public, like you and me, um, people that are, for example, not in uh, this um, wait list or, or this um, uh, beta testing of uh, DALI, for example. And so it basically snowballed from there. And with other services like Midjourney or DALI also opening up their beta to the general public to basically compete with one another. And so you can basically see on this slide here, um, all the main differences between these three services, um, both DALI and Midjourney are enterprises uh, services. And so they're very secretive um, about uh, what the training data is and where the data might be coming from. Um, but you can kind of infer um, where the data comes from by investigating and what kind of images that they can generate. 
and state of stable diffusion uh, on the complete um, opposite directions. It's an open source model. It's very transparent about where they collect the data comes, from, uh, where they collect the data, and what is the methods that they use to create these um, different images that they can can do. Uh, and um, and this actually uh, puts them in in really hot waters and a lot of troubles with uh, the uh, art community because um, a huge part of their training data uh, people discovered um, actually used um, uh, many of the contemporary art um, that are scraped from the internet. And so the artist communities was really up in arms about um, yeah, the ownerships as well as the copyright um, of their arts that are being used by these models. Um, another great thing about um, stable diffusion is that um, since the model is available for free, anyone can download it, you can actually build your own models and you can actually add your own art style by fine tuning um, on the existing model that is out there. And this is not possible with DALI or Midjourney, um, which are, as I mentioned, very um, close um, uh, and there, um, there's basically um, no information on, on what their models looks like. And both DALI and Midjourney cost money to make, um, although you can actually own um, the copyright of the image that you can generate uh, and stable diffusion is open source and it's accessible to everyone for free. And so um, the images are actually in the public domain, anyone can use it um, and um, yeah, can use it and commercialize it, I think. Um, and so uh, in terms of um, aesthetics and uh, qualities, personally from experience of using all three services, I think Midjourney is able to create the most beautiful and sophisticated image um, and it's followed very closely by stable diffusions and then DALI. And this is not a comment on the quality of the model and it's just a comment on the kind of data that they train on, right? So Midjourney and stable diffusions, they train on a massive amount of art data. And so the output are naturally more aesthetically pleasing than DALI, which from our understanding um, um, trains a lot on stock images. And, and we all know how stock images basically look like, not very aesthetically pleasing um, in terms of um, artistic um, style, I think. And um, so you can see more uh, or less the difference between the three um, uh, models here by the different images that they generate by using the same prompt. So for example, here, cherry blossom near lake snowing, um, something that we can still see, I think, in, in daily life. And as you can see here, Midjourney creates something that is quite artistic, right? So it basically, it mainly because it pulls mainly from um, artists and mainly pulls from um, different artworks together. And then, uh, so for something a little bit more absurd, something that we might not see in real life, right? So a lion riding, riding a bicycle. So Dali basically creates something that probably you would see um, um, yeah, on, on logos, for example, um, things that are in stock images. Um, stable diffusion is like something that is quite atrocious. I don't know what it is from. And then Midjourney, same thing, uh, something that is quite artistic. Um, there are some um, flavors of, um, I think, uh, modern art in there as well. And, and what about something a little bit, I think, more um, detailed, like cyberpunk cityscape at night and raining? Um, you know, as you can see here, um, also each of them create something quite different um, in terms of styles and in terms of um, influences in, in the artistic um, flavors. Um, and yeah, so this is a little bit more fantasy. This is a little bit more absurd. This is a bit more real life and you can kind of see some of the difference. Right? And um, so in order to create prompts um, that are able to generate good styles and good images, um, you can start with something very simple, right? You can start with something um, as simple as yeah, a lion uh, riding a bicycle. And this is what we call a raw text basically a raw idea of what you want to create. Um, you want to create a lion, you want to create uh, riding a bicycle, you just write it down. And this is a, a very raw text of your main idea that you want to create. However, um, if you want to make it better and if you want to make it more impressive, you can add in a lot of details and directions to help guide the image generation process. And um, this is basically stems from what we talked about earlier about how this model works, right? So this model works by having each of these words driving the image generation process. And so you can imagine each of these words here has an influence on how this final image turns out in the end. And so if you only have an, um, information on just maybe just a text on lion in a close-up shot, then it will not be um, as aesthetically pleasing as this because it basically uh, the what, the what the model does is that it will just basically pulls all the images that it are quite generic uh, in uh, for a lion. And so you will not have something um, very detailed in terms of style here. And so um, their AI art communities have experimented a lot 
with how you can actually do that, how you can actually add in different flavors and different styles and different directions into your image. And so this is the, the prompt um, guide that they have basically come up with. So you would always need to have the main idea, right? So the main idea is basically the details that you would like to see centrally as a focus of your image. Then you would need the format of the image, whether or not you want a photo, it's a realistic photo, or it's a photo that is um, maybe um, manipulated or an illustration or a painting. Um, then you would need the style of the artist that you would want, or maybe the art style that you would like to see. For example, it might be Renaissance, it might be um, Cubism, or it could be um, the different art styles uh, uh, that, that you, will, you can think of. And so these three are the most important things that you would need in order to create a beautiful image. The format of the image, the main idea behind the image, and the style of the image. And you can also add in a lot more to, um, to add more details to your image. For example, you can add in the mood of the image, like the color, the lighting, the contrast, and the exposure, or other details, such as different things that you want to see as part of the image as well. Right? So um, the formulas that people have come up with, um, and that this is basically, this is the one that I like the most, and, and the one that I've experiments with, and, and I think this one is uh, able to generate um, consistently good images. So I think the, the key word is here is consistency, right? So you can basically put in a lot of word um, vomit into a, a model and it can still create something beautiful, but to consistently create something nice, it's it's a very hard thing to do. And by following these formulas, um, you can actually create something that is very beautiful almost all the time. And so you start with the art medium, whether or not it's you know, a painting or a photo, and then you follow by a subject and you follow by perspective and the artist that you want in the style and then what kind of art style that you want, and the mood, the other details that you want, and maybe some booster keys. And so an example is the image in the background that you can see here. Right? So um, and by this image is generated by stable diffusions. And the way that I generated this image is by putting in this prompt here. And so the painting of a medieval princess, and the painting is the art medium, medieval princess by the window in Venetian castle is basically the main subject. Perspective is from behind. Um, and the artist is uh, Greg Rutkowski, which is a, who is a very uh, famous um, digital artist, a contemporary artist, um, and in the style Baroque. Um, and then the mood is that it's um, elegant and tasteful, um, and um, other details, you have sunlight from the window, um, and you have some booster keys, which basically helps to drive some of the, yeah, the, the style uh, flavor that you want, uh, which are basically vivid, beautiful, trending on art station. Art station is basically this platform that collects a lot of people's arts, and it's a platform for artists to publish their work so others can follow. And so um, a lot of the arts that are present in the training data for stable diffusion and mid-journey, for example, comes from ArtStation. And so by just having the keyword ArtStation here, um, you are able to drive some of the aesthetics and some of the flavor um, in the image in, in, in the end. And so uh, this is basically also another example of how you can actually drive um, the, the image to the style that you want to, uh, that you want to see. So uh, we start with a very, a very base, um, yeah, a, a very base prompt, right? So painting of a warrior woman, and then we add in the style D and D, high fantasy D and D is basically Dungeon and Dragon, a very popular game um, um, for multiplayers. And then by adding different artists, and so Arjun, uh, Rojo, and Vila are three very popular digital artists in the contemporary art scene. Here. And so by adding each of them in here. You can kind of see how the, the subtle changes in, in the styles that is added into um, these images. And so um, this is actually what um, the prompt that we will try to um, try together, um, I think, right now. Um, and the next thing I want to talk about is um, how do you actually do that? And so there are different uh, labels on how you can actually um, try to generate art. Um, so there's the beginning level, uh, there's the intermediate level, and there's the advanced level. And what I would recommend you to try first is the, um, the beginning level, which is basically, it's a very simple approach on how to, um, to generate it. It's basically um, use um, different stable diffusion search engines like Lexica or Night Cafe Studio, uh, and it's all free, right? So you can um, always use it um, uh, whenever you want to. Uh, and it's a very simple click and play and with very few for parameters that you need to tinker with. Um, and the next level is intermediate, where you have some more parameters that you can see here that you can tinker with and you can learn more about them. And the more advanced level is to actually download it and use it locally. And then you can actually like adjust different levels, adjust different parameters, and all the data that you generate stays on your local machine. So it, nothing stays on, on these services, right? So whatever images that you generate 
on these services um, on the beginning and intermediate stage, they all stay in these uh, engines. And so um, they are basically free for anyone to explore. But whatever you create on your local machine in the advanced level, it stays with your, uh, and you are free to share it, you're free to, to use it uh, for your private purposes and um, whatever you want to do. And so we will see how to use it right now um, with um, these different engines. So um, I would like to uh, first uh, try it out, um, this prompt, without all the flavors, right? So a painting of a warrior woman, maybe let's say, so this is Lexica. You can go to lexica.art uh, to go to this. I think you just need to sign in using your Google um, account, and then you can click on generate. Um, this, this is basically a search engine, right? Very similar to a Google search engine, but all the images that people generate stays on the server. So you can always search back on these different images um, later on in the future. And so what we want to describe, um, a painting of a warrior, Let's say we want to a male warrior this time. And yeah, we want to adjust the height so that we have a very nice image. We can click on generate. And then the next image I want to generate, it's this very same prompt. But we add in these different keyword flavors, right? D&D, high fantasy. I just forgot. Also about 860. And in the last image, I would like to actually copy this and see how good we can generate the image. And I would like to do the same thing with DALI as well. So for DALI, you just need to go to openai.com and labs. Um, and then you can also sign in with your Google account. Um, I think for the first few images, it's for free. So you can generate these um, without having to worry about um, paying for it. And the last thing that I want to try is Mid Journey. So the one that I mentioned is the most beautiful. So it, I think everyone can join Mid Journey right now. So you can go to midjourney.com and then you can sign in um, to, and then you can join the beta uh, by going to their Discord channel. So everything in Midjourney is created by the Discord channel, right? So you can sign in here. I already signed in into my Discord account. So uh, when you sign in to your Discord, uh, you can go to the new bees room. And that's basically where you can generate new images. And the way that it generates is basically you can go click slash imagine enter, and then you can put in your prompt here. And I would like to do it in my private server so that others don't know what I generate. So you can also invite um, the Discord um, um, server from Midjourney into your own Discord server, right? So that you can actually create things um, in your own server without having to worry about others, people seeing everything that you create as well. So I do the same thing, slash imagine, um, enter, and then I put in the prompt here. Okay. So we will wait for this uh, while it's uh, trying to generate. And then we will come back to first the Lexica model. So as you can see here in the beginning with um, the model in Lexica, which is basically um, run by stable diffusion. Right? So if it's a very simple, um, okay, yeah, put in one wrong text here. Yeah, if, if it's a very simple um, text, like a painting of a male warrior, um, then it's able to create something, but it's very basic, right? As you can see, it's very crude and it's not something that, I, that we would say is aesthetically pleasing. But um, if we go into this second image, when we have the Dungeon and Dragon and High Fantasy here, you can kind of already see the improvement in the image, right? So um, something very crude and something that is not that pleasing um, to something that it's a little bit more detailed and a little bit more sophisticated. And then finally, when we have all these different keywords uh, with the artist and the art style here, you can kind of already see, okay, it's a woman, should say male. And when you, you can already see like the, the kind of difference and in, uh, in how these models are created and how they are quite, quite beautiful and aesthetically pleasing. What happens with DALI with the same model? 
is that it's also able to create something that is quite pleasing, right? But the art style, as you can see here, it's not, I think, as consistent as um, the modern diffusion. Uh, and um, as you can see here, there's a lot of artifacts that are not very real that you can kind of tell immediately that this is probably generated by an AI. And finally, if we go to mid journey, yeah, as you can see here, this is probably the best out of all three models, um, as you can see, for mid journey. And for mid journey, there's um, quite a, different, a lot of different options you can do. You can um, also upscale each of these images. So for example, if I want to upscale um, this particular image, for example, and I will click on U1 and it will upscale and make this image in high quality, for example. And if I like the style in uh, image one, for example, I can also um, try out different variations and uh, in, by clicking these V1, V2, V3 here. And variations is basically, it's the same image, but then you can also have it in different angles, right? And different, um, uh, yeah. So it's getting a little bit more detailed here. And you can kind of see how the model gradually denoise here, right? So it gradually denoise from something noisy to something that is quite detailed. And so that's pretty much how you can create these different models um, by text prop engineering and crafting. And, um, and a lot of times I think like, and for me personally as well, uh, a lot of times like we would uh, be in what I would call um, a crafter's block where you don't really know how to, like what kind of things to create and what kind of um, things that you want to, to try it out. And so um, the community have actually created um, a lot of different um, resources that you can actually use. So for example, here, this is the prompt engineering templates or uh, you can kind of pull different keywords and different artists and different styles that you can use in order to create basically like um, yeah, like, a, like a very good prompt that you can um, try it out. Um, there are also other things that are very interesting, like for example, the clip inter interrogated model. And this is basically the um, same idea as the clip model that, that we mentioned, right? Something that can associate image with text. And so if you give it an image, it can actually give you what description that is in here. And so for example, for this uh, image of a cat here, it basically gives you the, the kind of text that can be associated with this. And then you can use basically this text to generate uh, a new model, for example. And another amazing thing is that you can actually use this thing, which is called magic prompt, stable diffusion. And uh, what it does is that it basically, um, you can just start with something very simple, right? An, in, an illustration of a chimpanzee. And then you just compute, and then the model will basically spit out um, random things that are already trained on different prompts um, for stable diffusions. Um, and then you can basically use um, that prompt for your uh, image creation as well. So it's taking a little bit of time. You can try to see this model. Yeah, so this is the cat model that um, I've seen earlier. And this is loading a little bit longer than expected. But yeah, the idea is as, but yeah, okay, as you can see here, it basically gives you some text prompts um, for inspirations. And then you can change and you can add more things and you can update things as you want to. We can also give it here to generate. So there's also a lot of things that you can try it out for. So negative prompts is basically things that you want to, uh, things you don't want to include in the images, right? So the this positive prompt is basically what is needed in order to generate image. Negative prompts is what you don't want to be in the image. And that's, I think that's all the things that I want to mention about um, this um, prompt engineering part. Okay, and um, there are also some other features that um, you can do with um, stable diffusions. So there's image to image, and this is basically means that um, you can give it like a very random images, right? And then you can give it some prompts to guide it. And then the model can create something from the original image that you feed into it. And so, for example, I think this is something that's very fun for uh, children to play with their um, parents, right? So, like the, the children can basically draw some very funky images, and then um, you can kind of help them to generate something that is quite real here. Uh, this is something that is very useful for um, marketers and advertisers, for example, who wants to 
um, have um, some um, perhaps like some um, models or some kind of um, examples that they can show uh, to their creatives on what kind of ideas that they have um, for their advertising, for example. And another feature is in painting, which is the ability for you to, for example, if you give it an image, you can kind of um, erase a certain part in that image and then can, you can replace it with something that is whatever it is that you want. For example, here, I basically feed in the prompt as uh, the Death Star in this area that I erase, and it, it can basically create this new Death Star here in the image. And it looks quite real. Another feature is outpainting, which is the ability of the model to basically expand on the borders of the paintings. And so this is the painting, um, a girl with a pearl earring. Um, and you can see here, you can kind of expand that out um, to include like a lot of different things as well. So you can have like a, a bigger photo, for example, of what you want to see. And um, yeah, three other popular features is uh, video animations. And so because the model is able to generate quite a lot of different arts, you are able to, for example, generate like different scenes and different angles uh, in an image. And so by doing so, combining them together, you can actually create like a video with different frame rates, right? And so this is a possibility with stable diffusion. And another thing that is quite fascinating is that you can actually train your own model. Uh, and so an example is that, for example, I'm, tra I'm training a model on um, Vietnamese folk art. So I'm from Vietnam and uh, we have um, a traditional folk art, uh, folk art that are, um, have been there, I think, for quite a long time, but then it's um, the, the folk art scene is um, kind of um, been diminished. And so not a lot of people are engaging in this art anymore. And so what I'm trying to do is basically to collect um, a big data sets of different folk arts. And then I basically can, can try to train the model that can kind of create um, these folk art um, that are just uh, coming from your text um, in prompt, right? And so um, this is something that I'm, I'm trying to do, uh, which is a bit difficult because uh, we don't have a lot of um, data um, and a lot of uh, images that are from the olden times, basically. And so this is a very limited data set. And so it's take a little bit of time to um, upsample um, the data set to create more data sets from this so that the model can train. Another thing that is very fun is upscaling, which is um, basically because the, the model is able to denoise, so you are able to actually upscale a lot of the images that are um, noisy, right? And so this is very, um, I think, very important for people that want to, for example, um, try to um, make the images uh, and the photos that they have um, um, a little bit less noisy. And so this is what I want to try when I come back to Vietnam next year, uh, which is to find all the photos, old photos that my parents have, and then I want to upscale them so that they're a little bit more clear and they're a little bit more, um, I think more, um, have some clarity in them so that we can actually preserve them digitally. And those are some of the fun features of stable diffusions. And so these are basically some more examples um, of the kind of images that you can create with stable diffusions. And um, yeah, um, after this, you can copy um, these uh, props and you can put them to the stable diffusions and then see what kind of images that you can come up with. You can try to do it multiple times, right? So usually the first few times is um, you cannot create something that is really impressive, but then after a few trials and errors and you can kind of fix, can adjust the prompts a little bit, then you can create something like this. Um, similar thing with um, Mid Journey as well. Mid Journey is amazing. It's um, something that can create something very intricate like this, for example, the armor on this cat here. And so what I usually do is that I try to create something in um, Stable Diffusions. And if I find a prompt that is very promising, a prompt that can that create something very detailed, then I usually feed it into Midjourney and to see what kind of thing that it can that it can create basically. Um, and these two, I think, are, works very good together. And so finally, we come to the triumphs and um, controversies of AI art. Uh, because we only have um, five minutes left, um, I want to go over this very quickly. But I think this is something that is very important to actually discuss about this. Um, first, we want to talk a little bit about the controversies about AI art. Um, so this is probably some, a lot of you already know about this. And so um, uh, very recently, um, an AI artist um, basically uh, brought um, their creations um, into a contest for general um, AI digital art, right? So, and so it's a contest for digital artists. And they basically, without um, any mentions, they put in their creations from um, Midjourney into the contest. And they actually won the contest against all other digital artists. And this cost such a huge uh, uproar in their artist communities that um, that they feel that their jobs are being taken away from them. That they feel that they are not being evaluated equally against an AI that is able to create thousands of images in a number of seconds. And so 
this is a huge controversy that started this um, wedge and, uh, between uh, digital artists and AI artists. Um, the second um, controversies that um, came um, just from last uh, month in October, um, the South Korean illustrator um, Kim Jong Gi. He's very renowned for his ink and brush art, um, and he's also very popular for this art style where he paints everything from memories. Right, so he looks at the scenery. Um, for once, and then he basically repaints everything from memory with a live audience. And so he's a really fascinating artist um, that I think um, you should check out um, and, and very popular in the anime scene. And he passed away in October uh, due to, I think, like heart complications. And just a few days after his passing, a model was popped up on um, Twitter that basically mimicked the exact style that he's able to create. And the model is still there. You can actually just go to the Twitter and you can download this model from Kim Jong-il um, artist, and you can actually create um, art style that is very similar to this. And so this basically also came out another floodgate of artists that really criticized our um, AI artists for basically being vultures and like um, trying to capitalize on the death of an, of an artist. And it came up with this um, really existential questions in the artist uh, world where, um, where, where's the where's the line? Where's the limitations for art, AI art in destroying traditional art? And so for um, traditional artists, they are very worried about these five things um, that I've seen from the discussions. They worry about the ownership of their art because these images they basically generated from their art that they created. And these uh, trading models basically scrape all their art online and create these, um, these art without their consent. And so who owns these arts? That is the question. Second thing is the livelihood, because like what, what happens now when all these artists, they spend decades to train themselves and to create art styles. And now these ARs are able to basically train and create the very same thing within hours. And um, this is a very existential question um, in the artist world right now in this moment. And it's basically an identity crisis um, for people um, that are wanting, perhaps wanting to go to the art world, but now are being deterred because like anyone nowadays can create art uh, without any training whatsoever. And it also creates the problem of oversaturations of the art market where now there's just an AI art engine can create thousands of images within seconds. Um, and an artist basically spent hours to months to even years to create um, a proper uh, artwork. And so with this oversaturation, then all the people that are creating artwork traditionally are now drowned out by the noises of all these AI arts that are just being uploaded constantly right now in the market. Then people, I think, have already uh, projected that in, um, in the next 30 years, I think 90% um, of the content that are going to be online is going to be created by an AI engine one way or another. Um, and then the 10% the, the is going to be created by humans. And so it comes also to the questions of ethics and liability. Who is responsible for these images that are created by an AI engines? What happens in the future when we have um, just thousands of images that are faking um, different things? And, and what happens with this uh, misinformation? What happens with um, people's livelihood? What happens with people's um, ideas and trust um, in, in societies? And so this is a big question um, that are basically creating a very clear battle line between the AI com art communities versus the digital art and, and contemporary art scenes. Uh, and it's a question, uh, when everyone is an artist, basically no one is. And, and what about the trends? And what about, it's about, the, uh, what about the things that AI artists uh, are, are concerning about? And for AI artists, um, they, they feel that these models, when they're open source and they're free for everyone to, to use, it's a creative freedom for everyone. And so everyone can use it and anyone, you, me, even people that have not trained in the art scene can also create um, creatively express themselves um, and, and create something beautiful. And this is, I think, something that's very inspirational as well. Uh, and um, me personally, um, I, I also try to do traditional art, but it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of effort to, to learn and to upskill some of these things. But for AI art, you can learn to, to become an, a prompt engineers very quickly, like within a few days. Right? And, and there's a lot of trials and errors, but then uh, when you learn the, the basics and you can actually do a lot and you can actually create something very beautiful and amazing. And it's an inspiration for new ideas, right? So um, we also have digital artists that basically use um, these tools for generating ideas for their actual, actual arts. And um, 
uh, and they are very much welcome uh, these new technologies that are there because they um, before they also have an artist block where they don't know what to paint and they, and they don't know um, how to come up with new ideas and this this new uh, technology here is basically to basically feed them new ideas constantly to actually come up with new things and then they can refine on these ideas and refine on these images that are created by the AI. And you can also optimize visual work. So as I mentioned earlier, in, in advertising agencies, you can create a lot of mock-ups before you actually create something that is open and able for the public for advertising purposes. Right? So this is um, can actually help a lot with uh, visual artists um, that are working in different industries. And then it can also birth a new art, st art style as well. As I, we mentioned earlier, by combining different artists' styles, we can create something that is quite new. Right? And so. Um, this is something that a lot of people have been also been trying out, which is um, combining different things to create something aesthetically pleasing and also um, something that is completely new that have never been seen before. And the last thing, which I think personally is the most important one, um, which is art therapy. Um, and this is coming from personal experience because I know someone um, who are um, who is on the autism spectrum, and so um, they. When they discover um, uh, AI art, um, uh, this is now becoming a routine for them. Every time they have a, a freak out or every time they have a, have a mental breakdown, they basically um, go into a, one of the art, uh, AI art engines and they try to pour all of their thoughts and all of their worries and all of their um, their sadness into um, this um, prompt. Right? And so they can actually put every stress um, that they have in their bodies into the art to generate something out of it. And it could be something um, grotesque, it could be something beautiful. And so I think this is something that is really important for um, the future of AI art, which is um, going to the directions of AI therapy for people, especially people that before we don't have the skills, we don't have the time or we don't have the money to actually like spend time to learn and, and to create all these uh, beautiful things. But now we have the tools available to us and we are able to express ourselves creatively and we have this creative outlet to let out all the anger, all the frustrations, as well as all the beautiful and happy uh, feelings that we have in, inside our heads. And so I think this is a very important thing to have um, and something that is, I think, quite um, amazing and that this is available for us. And um, so, yeah, and what is the future of AI art? This is the last slide. So um, um, uh, please feel free to, uh, to go. So I think we are past the time by uh, five minutes. Um, so the future of art, um, AI art, nobody knows what's gonna happen, right? But um, Going from the rate that we're seeing right now, I think there will be a few things that we can see in the near future. We can probably see many lawsuits in the future for copyrighted art uh, data uh, in the AI art communities. And most AI services will be a subscription base, similar to Midjourney or Dali. Dali. So um, Stable Diffusion, actually, just yesterday, they came out with Stable Diffusion 2. And they have already, in this um, version 2 of the Stable Diffusions, they have already taken out a lot of the art um, uh, that is um, from contemporary artists, right? So because they have seen the backlash and they have seen the potential lawsuits, and so they, are, they have actually put out a lot of the um, uh, digital art um, uh, works uh, in, in their models. And so in the future, so I think most AI art services will be subscription-based where you will have to pay a fee in order to generate like a certain amount of um, images. And there will probably some kind of shared revenue model for artists who contribute to training the data for these models. So very similar to, I think, to Spotify, where you, you put out your art and you put out your work and then you get some, um, some revenue and you get um, some, uh, you know, some, some money back for your efforts. Right? And so this is probably something that will happen in the future. And um, in the job creation market, and I think this is something that's very exciting. Um, so prompt engineers, I think, will absolutely be the next hot job in the market. So people that can understand what the models is like and can kind of craft text and kind of craft things that the model can understand. It's gonna be the next hot um, ticket, I think, in the job market. Post-processing of generated content will also be very important because uh, most of these models, when you um, when you have these models here, you can um, also uh, need to, I think, do a lot of, sorry, I think someone is also annotating on this, um, but yeah, um, you can also put in a lot of uh, efforts into um, post-processing of these images as well so that they can be more, palatable to the general public as well. And then those who develop the platforms to the, support the publics and enterprises to enter the market, they will be the next unicorn. So Stable Diffusions, for example, has already um, been evaluated as a $1 billion companies, for example. 
Um, so, and the art and entertainment and marketing uh, industry will just be forever changed because the future is now tailored art and media consumptions for a specific individual. Any one of us in the future will be able to just put out a prompt and we will we'll be able to get back whatever images, whatever videos, even movies that we want to see. And so um, please keep a lookout for further breakthrough and development in this industry. And um, that's about it uh, for um, my presentation today. So um, you can go to this link here, bit.ly uh, slash herdy slash art uh, to download this um, slide deck. Um, and you can also copy all of this um, different prompts so that you can create arts on your own as well. Uh, for our next event, uh, we next week, also on Friday, uh, we have the OECD, um, the head of the statistics department, who uh, will talk with us um, about um, how their data science team work uh, and what, what is the working of the OECD data science engine room. And uh, here are some of the resources that you can find um, to try it out, um, different things, as well as the references for this talks. Thank you everyone for joining today. And uh, please um, feel free to use whatever prompts that you can find on, um, on the slides and on this um, presentations and uh, make something amazing. Uh, we would love to um, see what kind of thing that you can come up with and please feel free to share uh, with us um, the images that you can create from these images, as well as maybe different models and different props you can think of. And um, yeah, we hope to see perhaps some of you becoming uh, future uh, AI artists and prompt engineers. Um, and um, hopefully one day you can come back and say, hey, I heard about this um, when uh, I attended this um, sessions uh, with the Design Lab. So um, thank you all once again. Um, I wish everyone a very happy um, weekend. And um, hope everyone have a wonderful um, holiday, uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas vacation ahead. Thank you and have an absolutely wonderful day. I will stop uh, the session right now. Bye-bye.